Um, just as a visual aid, if the narrator's not really described in this uh, story, but uh, this is about what he looks like. In a small tent on the desert, Robert and I smoke opium in a homemade brass pipe with two girls. A butane lighter follows the pipe around yellow and blue flames. I have smoked the earth, one girl says. I look at her friend who rolls her eyes in the glow of a cigarette. Robert tells us he's going outside. I lie back on a sleeping bag, my hands behind my head. The girl with the cigarette lies next to me, her long, thin body. She presses the cigarette to my lips. We share it until she drops the last of it in an open soft drink can. The drug and her smoky breath push gently against me. My eyes close, we are kissing. Red lines pattern like cracks in dry mud pulse against the back screen of my closed eyes. Within those eyes, rhythm and light and the color red. The desert pulses slowly. Lucid animation, teeth and eyes, wings of white birds, violence. The girl's lips on my neck. River of noise, river of quiet, river of blood. I am bloody and speechless, blissful. She pulls up my belt, unfastens my pant, my back against the breathing earth, eyes open, soft, her hand warm, drug bodies, moon through skin of red tint. The other girl watches, her friend's hands. Our eyes meet, she smiles sleepily, her brown eyes. I open like a child's wooden egg, a smaller one inside, then another and another, inside universe, inside black sky, inside desert, inside tent, inside hand, inside dream. Robert and I hitchhike from Oxnard to Palm Springs, two boys with sleeping bags and $10. It's 1.30 in the morning and we made it as far as an on-ramp somewhere in Riverside. Murky city reflection separates us from the night sky. The ubiquitous lights and death smell of Los Angeles seem to stretch around the world. A car drives by, the passenger screams and flicks the cigarette at us. There are no other cars for 30 minutes. Finally, a man in a Plymouth with a bad muffler makes a sloppy pullover. Car dark green and dusty, he leans across the front seat and opens the passenger door into the sick on-ramp on light. Tattoo on his forehead, a wooden cross, ink in fine detail over the left eye. Empty soft drink cans roll out of the car. I'm in the front, Robert in back, the man talking as soon as we get in. I had an AA meeting today, been blessedly sober for 72 days. It's not the alcohol, it's my other substance, metaphetamine. You boys done crank? His voice could grind corn. We head east out of Riverside toward the desert. He drives with one arm and speaks of guns, the death of small animals, broken car windows, his trailer in the desert, his ex-girlfriend's tits, the only way to do crank is to boot it, the rush better than sex or any other human rapture. It's hard to keep a good vein. Have you ever seen a black-tailed jackrabbit's ears? The, vein di the veins dilate to give off heat to cool the rabbit. What he would give for a set of veins like that. Lost his teeth before he was 30. Speed gave him the strength to read the Bible six times. Jesus was born in the desert, you know. While he talks, my own vision is of the buzzing tattoo needle shooting sparks into his head as his brain twitches like a dead frog's legs on a dissecting board. We pull onto the small highway that runs to Palm Springs. Outside the car, the desert sits dark and empty. Our driver talks on, his girlfriend, his ex-girlfriend, they score enough crystal meth for a month. Six days of not sleeping, on the seventh day he tilts his face toward heaven and shoots melted crystals into his throat vein, his, his body, his ex-body shaking, white circle, black universe, he collapses. Four days pass, he opens his eyes, a trail of ants across the floor, a large peninsula of blood spread and dried, the small finger of his left hand cut off with a pair of pruning shears, a note left by his girlfriend on the back of an unopened phone bill. It reads, I'm going to take this finger and feed it to a chicken. 
I ask, what did you do to your girlfriend to piss her off? There's a coffee, coffee can on the seat between us. He lifts the can and spits in it. You get a speed habit for six years, then you tell me what you did. He sees her sometimes, but they haven't spoken. You don't talk to messengers from God, he says. They talk to you. He holds up his left hand and wiggles the nub at us. The man with nine fingers and a cross on his forehead pulls to the side of the road. He looks down a stretch of gravel. There is nothing to see. You boys will be all right here. Above the empty road, the Milky Way bleaches the black sky. We hold, our hand, we hold out our hands to the few cars that drive by. An hour passes. We walk into the desert to look for a place to sleep. Small terrariums of land, of land where the flashlight points. We sit on rolled sleeping bags. Robert holds the flashlight between his knees, thin stringy light brown hair tucked behind his ears. He checks his pack for food. All we have is a package of processed cheese, 16 slices individually wrapped. Our hands pick at the plastic, dirty fingerprints on faded orange slices. We pass my dad's old horse blanket canteen between us. The water is warm, metallic. Robert says it's quiet out here. He throws a rock over my head. We wait for it to land. In the morning, the first car pulls over. The driver, it turns out, is a nun in civilian clothes. She asks us what we're doing there. We tell her that we were stranded, that we slept off the road. She laughs. I imagine the rattlesnakes enjoyed the company, she said. The nun asks where we're going. We tell her we came to see two nights of bands playing and driving near Palm Springs. In town, there are thousands of kids in the streets. It's not yet nine and several people are noticeably drunk. We pass six Hells Angels lying back on their bikes. A long-haired man, his shirt off, stands on the painted line between cars and pisses. In a fountain in front of a bank, a woman cut off some bra but washes with a bar of soap. At a spotlight, at a stoplight, a young barefoot girl, long hair, pretty face, leans into the driver's window and asks the nun if she wants to buy some mescaline. <laughs> Our driver says, this has a different feel than the usual spring break. <laughs> the woman drops us at a small diner in the middle of town. She says the breakfast is good and cheap. She says she hopes we enjoy our stay. She tells us to be careful. Robert and I spend six fifty plus a dollar tip on two number one breakfast specials, two eggs, potatoes with small orange juice, and two buckwheat pancakes. When the, waitress, when the waitress sets it down, she says, it looks good, don't it? In the diner, without asking, we are told all the hotel rooms are booked, thousands more are expected. The police have opened the Takwits area so people can camp there. After breakfast, we follow the trail of people to Takwits Canyon and spend the day along the creek with hundreds of other people and one naked man masturbating on a Tweety Bird towel. Dusk. Behind the drive-in, low distant mountains rise out of shadow. There is perfectly still. A few clouds languish in fading colors. A maze of cars and trucks are parked haphazardly around the desert. Thousands of kids moving slowly toward the concert or just stand around drinking. A line of people with tickets warms out into the desert. Ticketless and almost broke, Robert and I walk away from the entrance and look for a place to get in. Near the back of the drive-in, we head toward a cluster of people gathered around a young boy with short curly hair and no shirt. He's digging under the drive-in wall with an army shovel. As soon as we get near the group, someone passes us a half-done gallon of red wine. Robert takes a swallow and hands it to me. The wine is warm and feels like tin foil in my stomach. A girl smiles and gives me a pipe with a chunk of ha burning hash. The boy with the shovel strains up and waits for me to hand him the pipe. He takes a long hit, puffing his cheeks. He lets the smoke out in an exaggerated gesture, leans the shovel against the wall and ducks through the hole. Six people follow. The seventh halfway through is grabbed by guards on the other side. He yells, help me. Robert and I each take a leg and after a short tug of war, Pulling back out, 
flashlight beams, beams through the flashlight beams shine through the hole. The band starts to play. A boy about 16 dressed out of a Sears catalog says, this sucks. He turns to me. Give me a boost, he says. I lace my hands for his shoe and lift. He reaches the top with his fingers, does a pull up and looks over. Someone asks if there are any cops. He answers by disappearing over the wall. Incidentally, I'm enlisted to help more people over. A line of kids on either side of me does the same. Inside the drive-in, people are cheering for us. Someone behind me yells, we're storming the barricades. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Robert go over, my turn. I get a hand from a muscular drunk in a tank top who smells of wine and underarms. He stumbles backwards twice before he gets me to the top. The drop is about 10 feet. Cops and security guys are running toward the fence. The crowd inside faces us cheering. I let go and hit the ground running. A kid next to me grunts, taken down by the police. I head into the thickest part of the crowd, just another happy concert goer. People are laid out on blankets or dancing. Everyone is drunk, stoned, and crazy. I weave through bodies and speaker posts towards the stage looking for Robert. The music is loud. I feel it in my chest. A naked woman with a half gallon bottle of wine walks slowly by. Her breasts large and white in the artificial light. The skin on her legs dimpled and shaking. A dark bruise on one thigh. She stops to take a drink. The bottle falls from her hand. Wine and glass swash over the ground. A kid smiles at me and says something. I point to my ears and shake my head. He leans in and yells, you want some popcorn? He has a shopping bag full. I grab a handful. He grins and yells, we liberated the snack bar, man. We liberated the fucking snack bar. A <laughs> <laughs> kid smiles at me and says something. Oh, sorry. Uh, I start back towards the rear of the drive-in, past two girls, about 15, shirts off, long straight hair, tight jeans, hair brushes in their back pockets. They dance stiffly, smiling at each other. It's bright and crowded in the snack bar. Robert's in there drinking a Coke through a straw. People are yelling, throwing popcorn and ice. A woman in a leather halter top moves around jerkily, saying over and over in a loud, hoarse voice, I screwed Jim Morrison when I was 14. <laughs> a biker behind the counter has on his faded colors and a soda fountain hat. A kid still wearing his apron and name tags leans against the wall smoking a cigarette. The biker says to a grinning boy with short brown hair, I'm sorry, sir, we're all out of fucking large cups. Would you like a fucking medium cup, sir? <laughs> Robert tells me he got there too late. He missed the free cigarettes. The drive-in is a small radiance under the desert sky. Between bands, a crowd roars outside the drive-in wall. A car engine screams, a loud inhuman cheer from the people outside, then a giant splintering sound. Two car lights crack through the wall like some mutant medieval monster. The car gets stuck about halfway through, one back tire lifts off the ground and spins like a skill saw. The other sends up a cloud of black smoke. People squeeze over the car's roof and into the show. Behind them, a crowd yells, push, push, push. The car rocks back and forth. The driver has one hand on the wheel and waves the other over his head. Two security car guards and a cop run toward the car. They pull the driver out onto the ground and drag him across the pavement. A dozen more kids crawl around the car into the show. I look at Robert, his face flushed and beaming. Behind him, a bearded man on a blanket wearing only tennis shoes. Lace is undone. He has a bald spot on top of his head, lowers himself on a naked woman. She wraps her legs around him, his back rising and falling under the star-filled sky. Robert and I walk our thumbs out along a line of cars leaving the drive-in, car, drive car lights and dust, the sound of tape decks and engines. Two girls in a rusted blue Chevy Nova tell us to get in if we're going into town. The back seat is loose and rocks when we climb in. They're both pretty. Smoking cigarettes, pale skin, lipstick, home-cut hair, and bathroom bleach jobs. 
They turned constantly to talk to us, elbows over the seat, as if the car weren't moving. Heather is driving tall and thin in an unhealthy, sexy way. Sarah's shoulder, shoulders rounder, her voice softer. She offers an open pack of marbles over the seat. Her hand bounces as if the car, as the car drives through the desert. Have you guys ever smoked opium before? The tent is small, made for two people. Holding a metal flashlight in one hand, Sarah kicks off her sandals and crawls in first. Robert and I take off our shoes and follow. The air inside is warm from the day's heat. It smells of nylon, candle wax, cocoa butter, cigarettes. On the floor are two cloth sleeping bags, one with plaid lining, the other cowboys. Heather is last in. She leaves her sandals outside, crawls in on her long legs, and sits cross-legged, the bottoms of her feet black with dirt. Sarah finishes a lighter from her po fishes a lighter from her pocket, lights a candle melted to the top of a soda can, and turns off the flashlight. Like us, the girls think the world sucks, but they have more compelling reasons. Heather has run away from home three times. She says, my stepfather is a sick, perverted asshole. She shakes her head and lets out a huge breath. She has seven pink ray scars on her wrist. Sarah's scar is on her throat, where she clawed at her vein with a piece of broken glass in the bathroom of a mental hospital. Her mother is a Pentecostal who seeks to be filled with Holy Spirit, speaks in tongues at church, and sends her daughter to asylums to exorcise her. Sarah raises her hand, imitating her mother, and says, God has not ceased to reveal himself to man. Heather puts a tin foil, piece of tinfoil over a pipe bowl and punches holes in the foil with a safety pin. She keeps on a belt loop. She takes a tarry chunk of opium from the bottom of a cigarette pack. She pulls off a piece, rolls it into a small black ball, places it on the pipe and hands it to me. Sarah holds the lighter, old gray world spinning in my lungs. I let out the smoke through a smile. Sarah says, let's find Robert. <laughs> With our sleeping bags, we cross up from the tent toward the creek that runs down from the canyon. The black sky feels weighted. It flattens the landscape. We make our way through small groups of people and tents. Most everyone is sleeping or talking softly, quietly passing joints and bottles of wine. There is the smell of pot, of warm earth, of creosote bush and sage, the sound of crickets. We walk along the stream up toward the canyon. It's quiet, no one around. Robert sits by himself on a large flat top boulder. I toss him his sleeping bag. The girls and I take our places next to him, our backs to the distant city lights. Robert lights a cigarette. On the far side of the nearly dry creek, thin white bark trees stand straight on an eroded bank. Behind them, a large wall of striated rock, moonlit and swirled like a gray ocean chiseled by rain. We smoke the last of the opium. Heather knocks two small white tablets out of the cigarette package. It's acid, she says. I'm saving it for breakfast. We, we share the last two cigarettes and talk until the desert quiets us. The sky is a deep, beautiful black, wet with stars. Sarah, Sarah and Heather put their heads on Robert's stretched out legs and pull a jacket over their shoulders. Sarah kisses Heather gently on the cheek. Heather smiles, rolls her back to her friend, and closes her eyes. The four of us fall asleep. It's early morning. The sky passes from black to faded violet. Our boulder and shadow gray and cold. We sit in a circle. Heather gives me two tabs of acid. I flatten an empty cigarette box, put the acid on the cardboard, and cut it four ways with a pocket knife. My hands shake a bit in the cold morning air. There isn't any drinking water, the half tablets gritty in the mouth. We walk to a supermarket in town. The girls buy water and four grapefruit that we eat sitting on the curb in front of the store. Large clumps of fruit ripped out with fingers. 
Sarah stands and squeezes juice into open mouths, across faces, onto t-shirts. It was Heather I was kissing in the tent, but the memory is of, is of Sarah's smile. Late afternoon, the light waning, Sarah and I walk a road out of town, then turn into the desert. We follow a game trail between chola cactus and greasewood. The sky rhythm distant, soft, faded. Ground rises and falls in hard sand swell. She says, I wish home was like this, that you could just walk away. Five or six small wrens fly between a series of dry bushes. Sarah stops walking, pulls down a smoke from behind her ear and searches her pockets for her lighter. She's wearing a faded olive green t-shirt over her bathing suit top. The strap of her suit presses a white line into the sunburn on her neck. Sarah takes my hand. Let's go this way. We step into a wash and follow it toward a low set of uneven hills. It's quiet, just the sound of us walking. She talks about a time in her mother's house. Sarah goes into the kitchen with a pillow and blanket from her bed. She opens the oven, blows out the pilot light, turns on the gas and lies down. She says, my death dream was that I was floating in complete darkness. Then I see two white ovals. They are the perfect color white, a perfect warm shimmer. I have never felt happier in my life than to watch those two white shapes in a black sky. I could stay there forever. In the distance, I hear my name, then louder, my mother screaming in my face. She yanks me off the floor, pulls me outside, throws me on the lawn. She leaves me there and goes to the neighbors and calls the police and the fire department. I'm on suicide watch in the mental hospital for 30 days and locked up there for six more months. My roommate in the hospital is 15. She's been in there for two years. We get along. She's a good artist. The day after I told her about my dying dream, she hands me a piece of paper. It's a drawing with two circles floating over me. I'm lying down, my eyes closed. I look really happy. It's dark. Robert and I are on the boulder from the night before. It's been over three hours since we've seen the girls. They went to town to sell their tickets for the second night show to get some money. I'm on my back. The night stars wrap my eyes. Awake or sleep, the desert dreaming. Sarah and Heather are back with four white boxes of Chinese food, a bottle of wine two frat boys bought for them, a pack of marbles, two long white candles, a quart of melted ice cream, and four wooden spoons. We eat a candlelight dinner under a whirl of bats. Eight miles away at the concert, two helicopters, three sheriff departments, and the National Guard beat, arrest, and spray tear gas on thousands of people who thought America might continue to be the land of good fortune. After dinner, we take down the tent, put everything in the car. Heather asks me if I want to drive. I tell her I don't have a license. She says, that's okay, neither do I. We get to Highway 10. I turn east and drive further into the desert. There's nothing around. We leave the highway onto a gravel road north toward the mountains. There's enough moon to turn off the car lights. We drive for miles. The last page is always the hardest. We drive for miles, earth and brush pass in ghostly aspect. I stop when a coyote, gray and lean, trots across the road. Heather says, let's get out. Ground hard and colorless, sky breathing stars, the moon moves slowly among them. Sarah and I walk, hands together. She asks me about my father's death, death the year before. I tell her about visiting him in the hospital the day he died the noise of dinner being delivered to the patient next to him, the sweet warm smell of meat, my father's jaundiced stomach distended, a colorless liquid drips into his arms. He asks my mother if he and I can talk. She leaves the room. He squints with his glasses off. He speaks with his head back on the pillow at an angle toward the ceiling or something distant. 
We talk for about 10 minutes, the TV on behind me. When I call him dad, it seems strained as if that word has suddenly become inorganic. My mother comes back to the room with her brother and he takes me home. Sarah asks me what my father said. I tell her, that's the trouble I can't remember, not a single word. My hands in my jeans pocket, standing in front of a girl with a scar on her throat. Robert and Heather lie in the back seat with the radio on. We get in the front. I'm on the driver's side, Sarah's head a soft, perfect weight on my lap. Heather sings quietly with the radio. Love is love, not fade away. The music is small, compressed, a separate thing I could hold in my hands. The night passes. Sarah breathes evenly. I think I'm the only one awake. Then Heather says from the back seat, I hate that fucking Wemo Way song. I turn the car key straight up. The sand silent, sky consumes. My eyes are hiding, my eyes are swollen, my eyes are shy. I wish the stars were more than distant suns. <laughs> Mr. Michael McLaughlin is coming right up. <laughs>